So first off, I was wondering if you could talk about some of your influences. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I tend to think what influences you is everything you come into contact with. Mm -hmm. And I imagine you're talking musical influences. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my influences stretch back over the course of my whole life. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the church. My dad was a Southern Baptist preacher and my mother played piano for the church. So my first memories are of sitting there in the piano dock, watching her hands and listening to the old hymns and gospel songs. And that's something that you never really get out of, you know, your, your earliest informative memories. And my dad always had a guitar um, sitting over in the corner of the room. And um, he used to play some old timey songs like King of the Road and um, Water, um, Cool, Cool Water. Some of those old um, tunes that were coming out of the folk revival of the 60s when he was coming up. And, um, you know, th those were early influences on me because of course you see your dad playing stuff you think well it must have some kind of weight and worthiness to it um, and I picked up his guitar when I was 13 and started playing those songs from from those songbooks and um, you know as I, as I grew and grew you know other influences came in classic rock alternative rock college rock of course when I was in college myself and was playing in a band um, I think that one of the biggest influences though on me in my uh, post-college musical life was the anthology of American folk music that Harry Smith put out. It was released, uh, re-released in the in the 90s. I think it had, it had come out um, originally, I want to say maybe in the 50s or, or 60s, um, but re-released in a box CD set. And that collection really blew me open to um, the variety, the diversity, the, the total weirdness of, um, of American yeah. music. And, and I mean, there's everything on that, you know, from, from, from black preachers to cowboy songs to, to the Carter family to like, um, you know, um, New Orleans stuff. And so that really blew me open um, and really shaped what I discovered that I want to do with my own songwriting, which mm -hmm. is, you know, have something that grows out of that weird old American vein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and aside yeah. from that, I really like the Texas singer-songwriters. I think they're the best. I happen to be a little bit biased. Mm -hmm. But um, Towns Van Zant, Guy Clark, mm -hmm. uh, Hayes Carl, Steve Earle, um, those, those guys are pretty central to uh, me when I'm thinking about uh, the, the kind of songs that I'd like to write. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And do you think there's any other ways that Texas culture has influenced you as like, a musician besides strictly just musicians from there? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was born in Texas. I was born in Fort Worth, actually in the same hospital Towns Van Zandt was born in about 24 years mm -hmm. before. Uh, and growing up, you know, there in Dallas, um, being in Waco, you know, for school, um, we lived in the very southernmost part of Texas, Kingsville, down near Corpus Christi for a while, living in Austin. Absolutely. Um, you know, the music scene in, in Texas, the contemporary music scene was a huge influence. But, but aside from just music yeah I mean there as you probably know mm -hmm. there's a there's a pace of life about Texas and there's there's a lot of attitude that goes along with being a Texan and um, I didn't really begin to value that until I left Texas and I've been out of Texas for a long long oh, wow. time and um, it was only un, you know until I could see it from the distance of about 20 years that I, I started to think you know there were some valuable things that that I want to uh, reclaim mm -hmm. um, uh, so you know, um, I'm, I'm proud now to call myself a Texan, but if you talked to me in an earlier stage of my life, I might, I might have um, identified in some other way. I also grew up in the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina, uh. and I was much more prone to claim that as a heritage and a locale that felt um, closer to my heart. I mean, you know, just the beautiful, that, that was my, my childhood mm -hmm. after we left Texas and came back to Texas, but all of my formative memories were really in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And, and again, influences um, the, the, the mountain music of Appalachia and the, the clogging festivals that we'd go to as a family. I mean, all of that, all of that swam in. So how did you first get started with performing as a musician? Um, I wrote my first song when I was 13 and performed it for my family. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't until high school that I even thought about doing anything public. I mean, I played at a pep rally. I played Johnny B. Good with a, with a band. And um, I didn't, I, I, I liked doing it, but I didn't think I was, I really wasn't very good at all. And I, I, I didn't like the way that my voice sounded on a tape recorder. Um, 
when I got into college, I, I got into a band with some other guys and um, started writing songs and, and I would sing some of the songs. And uh, it, it kind of gradually grew on me that this is not, this is just something that kind of have to do if you're on stage, you gotta mm. perform. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, but, and, and that band was together about six years. Um, we were playing in, down in Dallas's Deep Ellum scene. You know, we were, we were part of that. We mm. made about four albums and toured uh, all over the eastern half of the country. Um, when we were finished, I mean, I, that's, that's what brought me up to Boston because I wanted to go to graduate school. And, and I put away music for a long, long time. I put the guitar back in the back of the closet, the amps stored back there. And I just, I just, you know, we've been playing you know, shows five, six days a week, um, living all together in a house for, you know, a long, long time. And, and I was just, I, I wanted to go back, I wanted to go into something else. Um, um, I knew I wanted to write poetry. And so I really concentrated my energies and efforts there. Um, so, you know, that was, as I said, a long time and um, I, I I've written three books of poetry and I have a novella coming out now um, and music really wasn't a part of my life for, for a good deal of time. I have a buddy named Kevin um, whom I met in Boston and he and we used to get together and he would play guitar and I'd sort of tap on the guitar you know do percussion and sing some while he was playing but he bought a mandolin and, and I said, oh, well, maybe I could accompany you on mandolin. I didn't want to play guitar. So I started learning the mandolin. And then he bought a banjo. And I was like, oh, maybe I could learn to play the banjo. So, so I started, you know, dipping my toes into the, the, the water in that way. And then about four years ago, I bought this um, old Gibson um, J50, a 1950 J50, um, from down in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And she was owned by a 90-year-old grandma. Oh, wow. um, who used to the, the the boys would take her out from under the bed on Sundays and and this woman would would play her cowboy chords and sing old timey songs and and it was the guitar I was looking for and from the first time I pulled it out of the case and played the first chord these songs started swimming out of her mm -hmm. I named her Myrtle because she's from Myrtle oh, Beach wow. South Beautiful. Carolina and so from the very t first chord like songs that I never could have imagined. Um, songs I didn't know I wanted to, to write, chord progressions that I had never tried before in my life. There was something in that guitar, and I firmly believe it's a spirit in that guitar that was wanting to express itself. And, you know, now Myrtle, I, I credit her as the songwriter. That's not the guitar I was playing in this okay. uh, video. She's, Myrtle is, um, she's retired now from outdoor concerts. Um, oh, no. <laughs> these these pandemic-era concerts have, have been real rough on her, oh, so yeah. I've been playing the Texas Epiphone. But um, she... Um, I credit her with with a good deal of the songwriting because it it ain't just me. I mean, I'm following the sounds that she's putting out, and, and I'm trying to follow her into the types of songs that she wants to express. And I know in some of the questions that you had sent prior to the interview, um, you were you were asking, you know, what would be your advice to to younger uh -huh. songwriters? Yeah. And you know, this is something I didn't know when I was a young songwriter. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wanted the song to bend to my will. I, I came to the song and I, I had an idea of, of what I wanted the song to be. I had an idea of what I wanted it to say and what I wanted it to be about. And one thing that I've learned is you've got to shut up and trust the song and you've got to listen to the song for what it wants to be about. So a lot of my process these days is just walking around the house, playing chords, um, and trying to play chord progressions that, I've, you know, that aren't familiar to me and then just making the most ludicrous mouth music, you know, within like, like oh, yeah. singing melodies and seeing what kind of sounds come out of the melody and, and in chords. You know, what, what are the vowels and the consonant sounds that are coming out of that chord progression? And you find the ones that sound right for some reason. Mm -hmm. And once you get the right vowels and the right consonants, then you start trying to find the words mm -hmm. that those sounds are trying to lead you into. So you don't know for a good deal of the time, you don't know what the song is about until the song tells you its first phrase. And then you have a little idea of what the first step might be. And then you, and then I started, you know, kind of joining in the process with, mm -hmm. with Myrtle. Yeah. And like, okay, so that's what you want to, that's what you want to do, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll see what I can bring to that subject. So that would be my advice, you know. Okay. Um, um, trust the song, don't, don't, don't spend a lot of time thinking that, that you alone are the sole source 
um, the song existed before you and it wants to sing through you. And so just be as attentive as you can and listen as hard as you can uh, for, for the first inklings of, of it. Mm -hmm. Would you say improvisation plays into that? Yeah, I mean, you've got to be yeah. elastic. You've got to be open, malleable. You know, um, yeah, definitely. If, you know, I find that the actors always say, you know, don't commit too early to a line or to the reading of a line. Oh, yeah. And, you know, um, don't think too soon that you have the definitive way you're going to say this. And I think that holds true for songwriters, too. At mm -hmm. least it does for me. That, um, especially when I'm writing lyrics, um, sometimes I start to rush it. And, and I think, ah, that lyric will go well. And then, then it's pulling me in the wrong direction. So I, I really do have to, you know, as you say, just improvise and stay open. And if there's, you know, if there's a, if there's a lyric that I'm attached to, I've got to be willing to, to let it go if, if, it's, if it's not going to be in the service of the song. Mm -hmm. Do you think your background with literature also helps you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, um, as I said, for years I was writing only poetry. And poetry is a, it's a closed system, you know, of, of, of sense and sound. It's, mm -hmm. it's rhythm, it's rhyme. It has a kind of music, but it's, it's, it's mouth music. And, um, and it's connected to the body's music of, of heartbeat, breath, footsteps, all of that. But, um, so a, 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 a poem has to, has to do a lot more by itself than a song can do because a song has the, has the help of melody and instrumentation. Okay. And once you introduce those elements, the lyrics, I found, they, they get to relax a little bit. It's not that they get dumbed down, but they don't have to do all the work. Like melody, harmony, instrumentation can do so much, can, can bring so much of the tonal quality, as you know, yeah. of, of the song, that in a poem, you're relying simply on the words to be able to read. Mm -hmm. So, but, but all, the, all the skill and time that I took in learning how to craft poems still comes into my lyrics, you know, I, I mm. still think about um, the, the line, the individual line, which is what we're always thinking about in a poem. You're thinking about the sound of the line, the rhythm of the line, the, the sonic structure of the line. Um, that, that, I mean, poetry taught me that, and, and that's still what I practice in, in songwriting. Would you say there's specific poets that have influenced your songwriting because of that? Um, I love the musical poets, you know. Um, yeah. I, I love Yeats, I love Dylan Thomas, I love Gerard Manley Hopkins. Um, of course, Shakespeare was a, was a wonderful musical, you know, playwright poet, too. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the poets that really influenced me were the ones whose words and lines sound delicious in your mouth. You know, it's like you're chewing on, on your favorite flavor of taffy. Mm. Um, and it has the benefit of like being immortal. The taste isn't going to go away. Yeah, like the words really come to life when you speak them out loud. Yeah, I mean they have yeah. a they have a muscularity about them. They have a sweetness about them. Um, they're, they're sinewy. They're you know they're 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 everything that you like in a fine meal. Mm -hmm. You know, like in a, a, yeah. a steak or lobster meal. You know, they're 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 thick and chewy. Um, and I, I love I love that. I think that a lot of poets. These days, American poets, at least, they're they're drawn in, in another direction into the conversational, and you can hear it in their readings. You know, they they don't they don't want to perform their their poems because they think perhaps that's going to be you know pretentious or it's going to sound you know like they're they're putting on an um, an affect. But you know, art is all about affect, and yeah. we know that as as songwriters and performers, like you've got to find the voice for the song, and and it might not be the same voice for each song mm -hmm. you know and and so you know why not i mean poetry and music have been sister arts from time immemorial and and it's only in our recent ages that we've separated them you know they they, they you used to sing poems you used to chant poems the russians still know what i'm talking about i mean <laughs> they 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 perform with vigor and expressiveness mm -hmm. their poems so i don't i don't see why um you know american poets think that we have to you know um just speak in the in in the in the in the cubicle voice you know let's 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 try out the arena voice sometimes all day 
way I've been in yesterday's blue Just sinking in yesterday's stew Just wondering if we'll make it all through To tomorrow out of yesterday's blue All day I've been in a bag full of rain My heels in the clouds and my head in the drain What it's all about Hard to explain, but it's all in my bag full of rain. I don't remember even what went wrong. I don't remember why it's hanging on. It's the same old song in a new set of shoes. Coming around like yesterday's blue. All day I've been in a ball full of gray Wound around and around and around the same old way It's a tired old yarn, every word that I say Winding up in this ball full of gray I don't remember even what went down I don't remember why it comes around But it comes around like the colors of the day Winding up in this ball full of gray Won't you take my hand I got one to lose Just give me the same old, same old something new I won't fault you too hard If I find it ain't true Just take me out of this yesterday's blue I don't remember even what went down I don't remember why it comes around But it comes around like a shadow I can't lose Hanging on like yesterday's blue It's the same old song To a slightly different tune Coming round like yesterday's blue So you're putting out an album soon, right? Uh, I, it, it goes live in a week August 20th is the date. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Border Radio is what it's called. You can find it on um, all the digital platforms, you know, from Spotify to Apple iTunes and all that. And, and um, you can find physical copies at Bandcamp or you can come to a show. I'll have, I'll have um, CDs there too. But um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, the, it's the product of, um, you know, as I said, the last four years or so working with, with Myrtle and this, this album Border Radio is volume one of an intended three volume set of songs. She's she's um, taken me into more than a hundred songs now so I actually have material for more than three albums but you know I can't record them all at once. But uh, one thing at a time. So Border Radio is the first one and it's, it's 15 tracks and uh, I'm, I can't wait to share it with the world. Yeah it's awesome. Well what do you say was your creative process for all that the well uh, for for writing for doing the album yeah for the album yeah so the process for the album was was completely changed because of the pandemic you know it became impossible to get into a studio with actual people and so um, you had to find another way to do it and and the only way I had ever done it was in a studio with actual people in real time like listening to each other talking about the songs and then working them into existence um, I didn't have that luxury so this album brings together about 30 people um, friends that I've known for most of my life um, going all the way back to childhood and I just wanted to put on this first album um, all the people that I all the musicians that I love and know and, and have very close at heart. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
So there are lots of Exeter um, people on it, um, lots of people from Texas, lots of people from just all over the place. Um, and it, it meant that, you know, I was sending out the basic track, which means just the, the song, me playing it on an acoustic with a, with a click track, a little metronome going, and then just singing it. And the, the people would get this, and it wasn't me saying, here's what you need to play. It was like, just listen to the song and see where it takes you. And some amazing things came back. I was I was just blown away by like the the miracle of the tracks that were coming in, not just the quality of them alone, but the way that they were fitting together. Mm -hmm. You know, so the way that the fiddle would fit with the pedal steel, would fit with the harmonica, would fit with the mandolin, would fit with the electric guitar, and you know, it, it just all came together. Of course, it took a lot of editing. Yeah. And, you know, this mm -hmm. album took six months to make. And, you know, usually you probably do an album in two or three weeks. Yeah. You know, so that was the process. It was like every day sitting there with headphones on, listening for the tracks to come yeah. in and uh, trying to fit them together. <laughs> so that's another reason I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled and excited to share it with the world. It's over now, you know, and yeah. um, it drops live, as I said, in a week. Cool. What were some things you had to learn for, I guess, remote, like, sessions? So if you would call it that. Oh man, I had to learn everything because I am completely illiterate when it comes to technology. So seriously, I had to, I had to just learn from the ground up. Like, um, and I don't even know if I should go into the specifics. Let's just say that yeah. I was I was a complete uh, dolt when it came to, and, and now I, I feel like, you know, I, I could probably do it again with a lot less time, a lot less energy and a lot less money. Okay, awesome. <laughs> when you perform at the team festivals, do you change anything about your set? Um, yeah, um, I do. I do um, more of this. Well, I mean, it's just me, and mm -hmm. so I'm. I can do any song that I want to, but I, I tend to think that some songs sound better with a small combo, you know, with bass and pedal steel. Um, so sometimes I tend to do um, some of the softer, more mellow songs, like the three that I've done for this. You know, just mm -hmm. just me, like doing picking songs and. I save some of the, the um, they're not really louder, but more energetic strumming songs. Yeah. I, I save those for, you know, for maybe a club occasion or for an occasion when I'll have some, some friends up on stage with me. Um, playing, playing out in, in clubs, I think, does change your style. You know, you're not able to play every type of song and, and yeah. be heard, you know. So, in fact, the, the three songs that I played today here, I, I probably wouldn't try to play in a club just because you know you, you got to try to engage the audience you don't want to play over their conversation but you want to try to like draw them in and um, and 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 play something that's kind of in the spirit of the the moment as they're sitting there and having a good time so yeah it, it, it has changed a little bit based on just the the needs of the moment and you know so a festival is you know you got a lot of people tons of people walking around out here but they're just kind of passing by yeah and so um, um, yeah I, I try to choose songs that are going to Try to try to compliment their mm. day as they're as they're walking down the Swayze. Although I know at the last one they had they changed it so it would be at the lawn instead of like by the river down there. Yeah. Or did you like that? I did. Yeah. 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 It was nice and shady. Um, yeah. I like being a little bit more up here in the action where the you know the the the, the art vendors are. I mean, I love visiting their booths and um, being a part of what they're doing too. Yeah. one that was written over behind Jerry's Variety Store in Exeter, New Hampshire. Bittersweet climbing up the side of the tracks You go down that line, you ain't coming back Make me a wreath of bittersweet Bittersweet climbing up the side of the train Don't expect to see your likes again Make me a wreath of bittersweet Make you jump and shout Mine blue north and hers blue south 
make me a wreath of nursery. Two love birds hatching in a little nest. Mine blue east, hers blue west. Make me a wreath of bittersweet. Take the Texas Eagle up from San Antonio. Meet my pretty mama in Chicago. Make me a wreath of bittersweet. Give my best regards to Delia Staggerly. I'll tell him, pretty baby, what you done to me. And make me a wreath of bittersweet. Bittersweet growing by the side of the road Learning how to love you is a heavy load Make me a wreath of bittersweet Bittersweet growing who knows where Won't you wind a little piece in your pretty hair And make me a wreath of bittersweet Bittersweet growing wild and free That's a bit for her and a bit for me Make a little wreath of bittersweet Make a little wreath of bittersweet Make a little wreath of bittersweet What do you like about the local music scene around the Exeter Seacoast area and what do you think makes it so special? Man, there's so much to like about the Exeter seacoast music scene and I, I, I'm, I'm a relative newcomer to it as a performer uh, but I have been amazed at the variety and and just the the abundant talent uh, well I shouldn't be surprised but but I just didn't know before you know extra when I moved here 20 years almost 20 years ago there, there wasn't a place where people performed um, there was there was the loaf and ladle which is where the sea dog is now and occasionally, I mean, they had an old upright piano in there, and occasionally you'd go in there and somebody would be playing a piano. And I know before I came, they used to have some bands. The Tavern at uh, Riverside, um, they weren't really having music. They, they started to have a little music every once in a while. Truffle was starting to play there. Oh, wow. um, and Shooters didn't have music, as far as I know. They, they weren't able to have live music inside. I guess still aren't. Um, I and mean, they didn't really have the beer garden stage set up at that point. Sawbelly didn't exist. Um, sea Dog wasn't here. Uh, Tailgate Tavern was. All these places have, have come in, you know, in the last, well, since I've been here. And and so I just didn't know that we had, you know, I, the Stone Church was here and, and we used to go to the Stone yeah. Church a lot, but a lot of those acts were, were national acts that were coming through. I know that there was a lot of local culture happening at Stone Church, but, you know, it was. It was, in, it was new market yeah. and um so it wasn't somewhere i was going every night mm -hmm. every day so um you know with with the explosion um just four or five years ago you know what what team is doing um and and what the what the local bars and restaurants have, have provided stages for for us to play now, i've been able to see a lot more and of course social media too you know now oh, that yeah. I'm, I'm, you know made friends is so why I get to see who's playing where and they you know people sharing their new songs their new recordings and their new albums and and yeah it's just it, it amazes me um, and, and and again the, the the variety I mean it's it, it's got everything that 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 a small local scene needs and I think we should be really proud of what we got here and, and we shouldn't take it for granted um, I know that when you go out to a bar or to a restaurant, you're there to eat primarily. You're there to drink with your with your friends. But if you see a, a guy or a gal playing over there in the corner, um, you know, throw a glance their way every once in a while and give an ear. 
you know, every once in a while. And for, for goodness sake, put, put a little money in the tip jar because those are hardworking musicians, right? And, um, and we shouldn't forget the, the immense privilege we have of like being in a community where the arts are really so vital. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that'd be my plug for, you know, local musicians, like keep doing what you're doing and, and audiences, um, you know, keep noticing that you got, you got these people that are working their, their butts off to, to keep you entertained and to keep themselves fed. Do you think you've learned anything more about social media with the pandemic? Or did you already know? Like, no, I, I didn't know much yeah. about it at all. It, it's been a steep learning curve. Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, all of this getting the music onto social media, like, like um, becoming a Spotify artist and an Apple artist and, um, you know, YouTube, you know, I mean, you know, you visited these sites, but it's a completely different process, you know, when you're, when you're now like a participant in putting up stuff and making sure it gets out to the world and then, you know, making sure everybody knows about it. You know, it's, you know, so it's the same with poetry. I mean, part of you, part of you is the artist that like just gets the work done, produces the work. And then you got to have the business side, you know, that, that, that really, the two can't come together or they get really depressed. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know, the artist just needs to be able to do um, their thing over here and then you got to put on your business hat and it's like, okay, I got to go you know, market my stuff because nobody else is going to do it for me. Yeah. And, you know, I owe it to the art to try at least to get it out there and have as many people see it as possible. Mm -hmm. That's why you do um, interviews and, and concerts on blazing hot days in the <laughs> sun, like sweat pouring down, losing five pounds yeah. of, and while you're playing. You do this because you think that the, the songs deserve to be out there. Yeah, that we really wanted to get the Texas energy for you that, guys. That's right, and so, um, yeah, I just closed my eyes and pretended that I was in Austin, and, and then oh, I'm yeah. just happy. Okay. Awesome, <laughs> thanks for coming out. Thank you this. very much for having yeah. me. Yeah. This is Mary Dyer. I came here with the reckoning done And I saw the scale sink into the sun And the fields were heavy with the heresy grain and a lone tree leaned and chuckled my name. Oh, up in Boston, it's a heart falling from grace. Oh, up in Boston, such a dark, professing place. Kissed my cheek, my tongue to check And knitted me a pretty noose around my neck Oh, up in Boston It's a heart falling from grace Oh, up in Boston Such a dark My skirts and covered my face My house of bone and blood to raise My spotty you kill, my spirit flies free There's the big wind taking the dandelion sea
in my shroud when I come to die With a thread too bright for the magistrate's eye No tongue can tell nor I can see That diamond dangling from the gallow man's tree This seat's getting real hot. I I'm, thought you wore the, t the shirt on purpose because of the question. I wore it because it was at the top of my shirt drawer, but then That's I thought perfect. this is a good shirt to wear yeah. for the interview on Exeter TV. So yeah, I'm plugging team, Town of Exeter Arts and Music. Thanks mm -hmm. to Scott Ruffner and his team for, um, for pulling us all out and through this pandemic into live performances. Thanks to all the, the businesses, uh, the breweries and restaurants, and clubs that have kept live music and original music going during this really difficult time. Um, and thanks also to the, to the audiences who have continued to come out and who continue to support live music. That's my plug. Okay.